tonight is one of the most special podcasts that I could possibly do. This has got to be one of the most incredible women that I have ever met in quilting. She is one of my great heroes in quilting. And I am very, very proud to introduce you to the fabulous Irene Heathcote. Hello, darling. Hello, Tom. What I loved was, is you had your tongue sticking out at me then. <laughs> I'll try not to do it on screen. No, no, do it. It's fun. So, Irene, why don't you tell you a little bit about yourself to our viewers? Um, right, yeah, I'm Irene Heathcote. Um, I was born in Watford and I live in Hemel Hempstead. Um, I've been married so long, I could have probably done three murders and got away with them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing a revolving hair. theme with my ladies and marriage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I learned to sew and knit from an early age because my mum made stuff, my nan did, my nan had been a tailoress, trained in Savile Row, and um, it was just sort of automatic, and did it at school and everything, and I just enjoy it. It's, it's a way of expressing yourself. So how long have you been sewing? I've actually been sewing since I was about five. And, and uh, am I like, now I've got a standing joke. Anybody who knows us well about was about two or three years ago, I asked you what year you were born in. May I tell this little story? Yes. <laughs> so, Irene was born in 1950, but when, when she told it, I thought she said 1915. So Irene went, she was 103, 104, 105, and she's 106 this year, but she's not. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> it's true. And it's his own my... special nickname for me. I know, you're my little old duck. <laughs> I love you to pieces. So how long have you been sewing for then? That's about, what, 66 years? Yeah. That's one. Yeah. What's your favourite craft to do? That's difficult. Because there's lots of crafts I've done that I just don't do anymore. I'm hopeless at embroidery, but I used to do loads of cross stitch. Um, I did crochet, but I don't do that anymore. The only thing, my nan tried to teach me how to do tatting. And it's the one thing where you have to make knots and I couldn't make knots, not intentionally anyway. <laughs> it's to do with thread and a shuttle. <laughs> it, was, it was just pulled to pieces. I was going to say, I've never heard of tatting, yeah. but I, I fully know what you mean about making knots unexpectedly. But no, but most of the sewing I did, I mean, when I was little, I used to make like dolls clothes and things like that. And I used to make cat suits and all sorts of things with chiffon and never, never thought anything about it. Just used to get it out. My mum had um, a hand singer. And so it was all made on that. Eventually, my dad put a um, an engine, you know, a motor on it, so it was electric, but it was still the basic machine. Um, my nan, she had a treadle singer, so that was brilliant. I loved that, and she actually taught me how to make. Uh, and I actually made when I was about sixteen. I made myself um, a coat, a heavy winter coat, and learned how to do bound buttonholes and all that sort of thing. And I had a matching skirt. Uh, it was a bit like wearing a blanket because <laughs> it was so. <laughs> but it kept I'm the cold. Toasty. <laughs> it kept the cold out. <laughs> and then when my kids were young, I made the odd bits and pieces for them. When I was 16, I, I left school on the Friday, started work on a Monday. And uh, the first thing I wanted was my own sewing machine. Well, in those days, um, you had to be 21 to do what? anything. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you didn't become an adult. You weren't an adult until you were 21 then. And so my dad had to sign the higher purchase agreement for me. How and I think, I think it cost me 45 pounds for my electric singer machine. And it was brilliant, did loads of stuff. And then 15 years later, busy finishing a cowboy outfit for my son on Christmas Eve, it stopped, wouldn't go again. And oh, so they just, the man in the shop said, can't fix it but I'll give you 50 quid towards another one so I'd had it for 15 years and I was still five pound up <laughs> <laughs> what did you do with the five pound buy yourself some fabric no I didn't I actually bought um it was, I bought a second hand machine from them and it was called a new home which I think is the precursor to do you know me it is yes 
and it was a real it was a brilliant machine but it was so heavy it was really heavy and i used it for a while and then just got fed up with it because it was so heavy but um and then when i packed up all my um knitting machines i sold those and i treated myself to a banana and a horn cabinet to put it in and i had that one uh for 20 about 22 years and then the main board went so my husband asked me if i'd like a new machine so i said just please and so i bought a juki <laughs> Well, well I'm a Juki what, boy as well now because of you. Yes, I yeah, and, and and I like that. It's it's really good. But I have got one or two other machines, as you know. I don't know what you're talking about. We all only have one machine. I don't know what you're talking about. You, I haven't got as many as you, John. I don't know what you're talking about. I've got one machine. <laughs> yeah, you only can use one at a time. <laughs> Well, no, I've proven you can use three at a time. You can use the long arm, the embroidery machine and your sewing machine all at one yeah, time. Yeah, that's true, <clears throat> that's true. Yeah, but you know, that, and I just, just enjoy it. I mean, I didn't know anything about patchwork at all until I was 21. And um, my mum had a friend up the road, her daughter came down the road and she said, oh, look what Sheila's made. And I said, oh, and it was a tea cosy. And it was made out of tiny hexagons. Right. And I said, oh, yeah, that's nice. I said, uh, did it take you long to make? She went, oh, um, about six months. And after she gone, I said to my mum, you won't catch me doing blooming patchwork. <laughs> <laughs> And that was it. And it wasn't until, oh God, some 20 odd years later, when I was working in the school, we had a supply teacher come in. She was sitting there doing patchwork. And that actually was Sheila Fryer, who started Emma Quilters. Um, unfortunately, she passed away a few years ago. But yeah, she, she was a supply teacher. The lady, Jean, she lived across the road from me. She came across and said, I've got all these 14 inch blocks. I thought, that seems a funny size. And it was the days of cardboard templates, a pencil, scissors, and you hand sewed them together. A lot of the trouble we have when we're sewing complicated blocks, it's like where they all join. If you want, if you do it by hand, you don't have any of that trouble because you don't sew right to the ends of the row. And when you're joining, you sew diagonally from the front through diagonally to the back piece on the opposite corner and then through and round like a figure of eight through the join so that you can turn you can actually turn the seams on the back so they rotate round and it's all nice and flat in the middle the first quilt show i went to was probably about 1991 i think it might 1990 or 1991 when the national championship was at hatfield house and they had a children's section which was over the rainbow. And it so happened that my daughter, who was about 10, um, they'd done the play at school, The Wizard of Oz. And so she drew something with a yellow brick road and The Wizard of Oz and Dorothy. Don't ask me how, we'd never put anything together before, but she did it all and we, I helped her a bit. And so she entered something and got a rosette. She didn't win anything, but it, oh, all the children that entered got a rosette. And I have actually still got it. And I did ask her if she would like it. And she went, you must be joking. She said, I wouldn't put that in the dog's bed. <laughs> <laughs> but now speaking of awards for this, now I, not knowing anything about my lovely little Irene Heathcote, I Googled you a couple of years ago and I found that if I'm not very much mistaken, you had a little trip to the palace, darling, the proper Bakayam Palace. Tell me a little bit about that. That was for the tea party. Yes, let's well, start at the beginning, start at the beginning. Right, one of my patchwork magazines came, I think it was Patchwork and Quilting, and there was a little article in it from a lady who said that she was starting up Project Linus in this country. Her name was Anne Salisbury Jones, and she lives in Birmingham. And she was looking for people to help her. Well, we hadn't long had a computer that was attached to the internet, although it was still dial up and emails. So I got in touch with her. And um, I think in the end there was her Anne and another three, three of us. And so we started off doing Project Linus 
in this country. Me being the optimist, decided that I listened to Three Counties Radio, so therefore I would do beds, hearts and bucks. Worked out where the hospitals were, where everything else was. I did a bit on the radio, I spoke to Robert Peroni and it started to go bananas, as it does. I met Anne um, the following year at Malvern. Um, you'll just see over there, there's a, no, that one. That corn, that tree there is part of a 12 block quilt, which was done as a swap on um, BQL Yahoo group, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, the, the theme was uh, forest, uh, forest ferns and trees or something like that. And leaves, that's it. Trees, leaves and forests and whatever. And so we entered it. Didn't expect to get anything, but that didn't matter. It was nice to see it hanging up there. Um, and so there we met the other ladies that were involved and we started doing bits and pieces. And then I think the first festival of quilts was, was it 94? And Anna contacted Andrew Salmon and he offered us a free stand. So I made a banner and tablecloth and turned up in my little car with all this stuff, including a step of, set of steps and hammer and nails and God knows what else you ever need. Um, met Anne there and we stood it up. It was a good job we'd taken a lot of stuff with us because instead of like a two metre pitch, we ended up with a six metre pitch. And we got leaflets and stuff and it, it just went mad. Everybody was so keen. So we went to quite a few, I think for about four or five years. Um, after, I mean, I, I was delivering to about six hospitals at the time, taking stuff around. And then- Did you just, only uh, do that in this area? Because you're yeah, in the um, it, aren't you? I did, I did um, Watford, Hemel, Luton, Stoke Mandeville, High Wycombe and Wexham Park. Sorry, that's six. Six. This is some serious sized hospitals as well. Yeah, well, it was for the um, maternity unit and for the children's ward. So what and is Project Linus? Just, just as a brief Linus, for people who may not know. Yeah, Project Linus is an organization which was started in 1995 in America. Charles Schutz, who did the car, Peanuts cartoon, actually let them use Project Linus for the name after Linus, the little boy who always had his blanket. And in fact, oh. the symbol is Linus with his blanket. How wonderful, I never knew that. Yeah. Now, you were very closely involved with Linus for a number of years. Did you not end up being president, if I recall? Yes, after four years and decided, she'd had one or two health issues, she decided she didn't want to do it anymore. So I said I would take it over and do it for two years. So that took us to 2006. But by that time, I'd sort of got my finger in another pie as well. <laughs> because we had um, the 2012 Olympics coming. And I was talking to my father and he was telling me about how they used, because he lived in London, they came around and collect the ashes for the running tracks and everything when it was in 48. And um, he said, oh, I expect you'll do something with your sewing. I said, said oh, I expect somebody will. And he looked at me and went, yeah. And I went, mm, sort of thing. <laughs> so I had this idea, spoke to one or two people, roped a few others in, which I just wouldn't have happened without their help. And um, we put it in one, patchwork magazines because I'd found out about all the ones that have been given in, in Atlanta. They had um, two quilts for every country. One was for the flag bearer and one was for the association of that particular country. So I had the book of that. I'd looked at that. And I thought, well, we'll see what we can do. Unbeknown to me, another group had already decided they were going to do something similar to that. So after a bit of kerfuffle and a meetup, because we had the support of the Quilters Guild. And then for some reason, I think football was on in South Africa. And my son sent me some pictures and all these teams, they had pennants. Now, what is a pennant? A pennant is actually a small flag. It's usually a triangle, but not always. 
So this sent me sitting and we were sitting there talking and somebody said, well, what do you think we're doing? And um, Catherine Hill was with me because she was helping. She sort of like helped me coordinate it. She was joint coordinator in the end. And I just said, we're going to make a pennant for every athlete. And she looked at me and nearly fell under the table. Because how many athletes were there going to be? Well, that's it. Because I'd already spoken to my son and he said, we're going to be at least 10,000, mum. I said, fine, okay. So I said, well, I think there's going to be at least 10,000. And they said, well, does that include the Paralympics? I said, I have no idea. I said, but we'll have to see. And so, but the thing is to do it, we opened it up to all types of textile. Now, here is one I started. And you're going to ask me, well, why have I still got it? And why was it started and not finished? It was the rules. There were so many rules. Because we aim to become part of the Cultural Olympiad, in fact, we were the very first textile group to be recognised as part of the, the um, Cultural Olympiad. You could not use this word. You definitely couldn't use that. You couldn't use London 2012, any other. You couldn't use the word medals or the names of the colours of the medals, but you could use the colours of the medals. So you couldn't write gold, but you could use something gold. You could use gold. It was, it was horrendous. But anyway, it got going. Catherine was brilliant. She got in loads of support. We ended up, there was, I think about nine or eight or nine of us locally. Those ladies were brilliant. You know some of them anyway some from Patchwork Corner and others as well. Um, we also had a network of coordinators around the country and they were How doing- How many things. did you make in the end? 17,001. 17,001. Um, well, all the pennants went off. That was that, that was finished. And after that, I thought, right, that's it. I'm not doing anything else. So yeah. what happened after you and your wonderful team had made 17,001 pennants? You've now been the president of Linus for a number of years. You're very active in the Quilters Guild for a number of years. What then? When my husband retired, I went back to work for six months. Got, one day was pretty <clears throat> one of them days. Got home. My husband said, there's a letter for you from the Lord Chancellor's office. And it was to tell me I've been awarded a British Empire Medal for Arts and Crafts. So I got that. This, if you get a British Empire Medal, you don't, don't go to Buckingham Palace for it. It was presented to me by the Lord Lieutenant of Hertfordshire. And so I think there were about nine people. My son was able to come, my daughter wasn't because of kids and school. But yeah, and we had that and then we had tea and cakes and, you know, general what have you. So, but when I read this letter, I was absolutely flabbergasted. But it was for my work with both Project Linus and Quilts for London. It's incredible. It's such a wonderful thing to have. But we have been to, my husband and I did go to that. Um, I got this in the April and in the June, we went to Buckingham Palace to a garden party, which was amazing. And if you don't know that the Royal family come out and they make lines of people and each one, each member of the Royal family, a different one goes down their line. And the Queen went down our line and the people they talked to are picked at random. And she picked somebody two, two people away from me. <laughs> oh, no. But she was, she was standing so close. So I could have nearly put my hand out and touched her. She's charming absolutely charming oh what a so, special um, happened. it was a it was just a very special day but the i think it's important thing to remember is, as well the reason that it is is because of the care and kindness that you've given to so many others like project linus is a phenomenal charity it's an incredible thing and the mm -hmm. love and care that you've given and helped to give so many other people to give it's an extraordinary thing that you've done so i i think every now and then i hope you do remember how special it is yeah, but I mean, it was, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people are involved. I mean, you can't do any, it's very rarely you can do something completely on your own without support from others. And with the support from others, 
whether it just be acquaintances or friends, are what makes it. Because if you have an off day, there needs to be somebody there to step in and take up. And, and it, it was just fun. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It completely overtook the house, both of them. <laughs> it's all right because, you know, once I emptied one room, I just moved more fabric into it. <laughs> <laughs> And oh, then, it's so, so special. You know, I mean, I belong to me quilt. I, I did join Hemel Quilters and I belong to me quilters. How many groups do you actually belong to now? Well, I, I belong to Hemel Quilters for quite a while. But then when I changed jobs, I had to work some weekends. So that didn't work. So I joined Mead. I was going to Mead for quite a while before I joined. And then I sort of got stalked by somebody on Facebook. So uh, I ended up joining quiltering, <laughs> <laughs> which was brilliant. You know, that is the most fun group I've really ever belonged to. It was, it was brilliant. And I've done more work then than, than ever. And I also belong to a small group in St Albans, which unfortunately seems to have sort of folded. It was only a handful of us and it seems to have sort of disappeared over lockdown. Um, whether it will come back up or not, I don't know. But um, I used to get more done on that Thursday because I found that, like Sylvia said, the company of others spurs you on and you see what everybody else is doing. So you have to get yours finished because you want to go and do what they're doing. It's true. And there's this mad person who keeps saying, oh, I've got another idea. I don't know who that could be. No idea. So what are you working on at the moment? Because I'd ask you about your UFOs, but I don't want to embarrass you. Put it this way, there's more UFOs than I've got fingers and toes. <laughs> I think fingers and toes of your entire family. Have you got a Beveragino there? Yes, I got some water. Oh, I don't believe that's water. That's pure vodka. I know you. What am I working on at the moment? Well, I'm supposed to be working on uh, oh, binding the three quilts that you quilted for me. <laughs> just the three. <laughs> just the three. It's very large half square triangles. Um, after I, all everything else, I ended up being chairman of Me Quilters for three years. And we had um, an exhibition coming up and we asked for a, um, we, ha we do a charity quilt. And so the charity quilt was quite large, about seven, eight foot square something like that uh, and it had some of these colors in and so um i just um had some over put some extra bits with them because that's an old shirt and um just put it all together to make one up for me um i've got to quilt it that's the thing i love patchwork but i don't like quilting. If only you knew someone who did that for a living, if only. The one behind me here, mm. over my right shoulder, is, I hate to say this, it's over 20 years old. And I'd started to hand quilt it. Um, and it's a sampler quilt. And I don't know why I don't like sampler quilts. And I thought I am never, ever going to hand quilt it. I didn't like the backing I'd used. It was a bit rough underneath because it was the first big one I'd done. So I've unpicked all the hand, hand quilting, all two blocks of it. And um, that's another one that needs quilting. I've got another one here. Oh, and other bits. I do love it though, because especially when you have so many projects, you literally will open a bag and find five more. So it's, it's yeah. one of those things that will keep mm -hmm. going. Scrap quilts. You see, you do amazing, amazing scrap quilts and really beautiful crumb quilts as well, which I love. At the um, Best of the Quilts two years ago, I think, I did a workshop with um, Chris English. He, he's um, at a full English, that's him. Um, and he was doing this similar sort of thing. And I've actually got a piece that I'm gonna turn into a cushion he's on instagram as a full english brilliant he just he makes things out of overalls and everything else and one he finished the other day he made out of some overalls with you know the white strips the fluorescent strips on them and he just used it and when he took a picture when it was dark and all these little white bits all over the quilt are illuminated 
How wonderful. It's brilliant. But I collect strips because somebody keeps giving me scraps. So that is that one was a strip from that way that I put in there. And all it is, it's very simple. It's a great one for take a piece of fabric. It's a rectangle. It's it's um a flimsy sort of cotton. And all I did was put a strip on, lay another piece up against it, sew it, flip it, and then the same the other side. And I know they've all got to be squared up, so I'm not sort of too worried. And you keep adding, and then you can join them either side to side, or you can put sashing in, or whatever. Oh, that's brilliant. It's quilted. Are you putting a wadding in between it to make it quilt yeah. as you go? Um, this one has, yes. I didn't on this one, I forgot, so I'll have to redo that bit. We won't talk about that one. <laughs> Here's one I didn't prepare earlier. Here's one I didn't prepare earlier. But um, one thing I will show you, can I show you? Of course. My mum was very young when she got married. She was only 19. Um, my dad was 28. So in 1998, it was their 50th wedding anniversary. And I said all along to my husband, I'm going to make them a quilt. And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we went to Chilford, I think, that year, earlier in the year. And I bought loads of yellow fabrics, which you couldn't get very easy. <clears throat> and um, we had our anniversary, our anniversary in September. And he said, I thought you're going to make a quilt for your mum's anniversary. I went, yeah. He said, well, it's only a few weeks away. <laughs> so I decided to do a double wedding ring. but I. I simplified it. Oh, wow. I, I actually incorporated the corner blocks in the segments. That's really clever. It's all, it's um, four by five. So it's more of a quilt topper. And I was still working at the school. So every break time and lunchtime, it was all hand sewn to put it together. And I was sewing every break time, every lunch time, put it all together. And then I quilted it the best. I, well, I only did wiggly quilting because that's all I knew how to do. In fact, it could probably do with a bit more quilting on it. And I, I quilted it in three evenings. And then it took me another two evenings to do the binding. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a, that's a lovely bias binding on that as well. That's beautiful. Yeah, well, I'm, I did make it all. I made it. So my mum and dad were absolutely thrilled. So, and it was rather nice that they had that. That is but, lovely. Yeah. But I know my, my taste in quilting have changed. I'm gone. I'm going much more for, shall we say, brighter and bolder colours. I still am not very confident using plain colours. Why? I don't know. But if you look at what you've got there, those are very bold colours, but they are quite, I don't know whether the term plain is appropriate, but it's a beautiful colour combination there. You, the one you've just shown, the double wedding ring. That yeah, is a yeah. combination of colours. I think you've got an excellent eye for that. Yeah. I, I'd like to make another one, but I'll probably make it scrappy. Um, because I've been following, um, ah, I've forgotten her name, Virginia. I can't think of her name. Yeah, that's right. In America. And um, she Manhattan, does. Manhattan, darling. Manhattan. Manhattan. Long Island, she lives. All her studios on, in, in Manhattan. Yeah. Um, but she, it's, she does lots of bright things. And I've tried her herring bones out. And I did the very strong one, which you quilted for me. Um, that was nice. And then, as you know, John was very rude about my age. <laughs> but, but but and in a way I know it sounds silly at the time my mum didn't get to 70 and so getting to 70 myself was something was with a bit of a you know it, it was quite an emotional journey and when I went to quiltering that week that evil John and the horrible ladies but the group had made me two quilts. Well, I have got I'll the big one. You, I have to, you know the story as to why you had two quilts rather than one. 
we don't have to worry about that. no no because one of the ladies had given me four of the blocks yeah. um and i put them in a very safe place put the quilt together quilted yeah. it sent the pictures around to everybody and this lone message came oh well my block's not good enough i said your blocks are in they're like no and that was when i opened another bag which had other fabric in it and i found the four blocks so that was why you had four um, you had a rogue quilt with that. So this is the little one. But the good thing is, Irene, because you're so sweet and little, it's perfect for you. I well, know. You're little. It's beautiful. It really is beautiful. It's lovely. And the big one is enormous. And we've got a king size bed and it goes right over it. Well, I'll put those on with a picture and you can see them from there. Yes. And, uh, you know, I mean, even the label, he's put a duck on it. Quack. Quack, quack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one more. The one I, one, the last one I finished. <laughs> I hand quilted this drum. That's incredible. Shock horror. It's scrap quilt. This quilt is the last one I did. It was made um, out of scraps. People always give me scraps. What would, you, what would you say is your message to new quilters? Firstly, have fun. Don't get hung up on doing what you think you need to do. The trouble is, as we get older, we get less spontaneous. And so if you give something to a child and tell them to draw it or do it, or how would you put this together, they will do it instinctively without worrying whether it's right or wrong. And I think we lose that as we get older because we overthink things. Do you think in part there is as well that the culture that, especially in quilting, it has to be perfect? <laughs> I don't do perfect. No, I, I know what you mean, but I think that, do you, you, yeah. you have to agree, there is a lot of judgment with regards to quilting. And there if it's is. not perfect and it's not exactly right, it's rubbish. And yeah. there is that perception and there is a lot of, I've struggled finding a way in this quilting world because I am far from the mold of a standard quilter. And I've really, really struggled with that. And I do wonder whether as you get older, you're less spontaneous because of that perception. It's just yeah. a thought. I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. I, I, th I think you're right. And I think something in a way which has made that worse. And I know this is going to sound awful, but it's the level expect it's something like the festival of quilts. How often do you see what I call an ordinary quilt? I've, I've seen quilts in there where it's supposed to be my first quilt. And I think it might be the first quilt you put in an exhibition, but that's no way your first quilt. It's, it's become literally a competition. I think one thing that helped me was that when I started, I was given cardboard pencil, needle and thread pattern. And, I was and a pair of scissors so that it yes, wasn't. Yes, yes. And some old American magazines. I've still mm. got some of them. They are brilliant. They are not all in colour. They just tell you whether you need light, medium or dark fabrics. Brilliant. It gave you room to think about it and use your own judgment the best thing to do are bricks yes bricks are fantastic because you take one piece you join it to another the next row you cut a bit off and you join it and so all the joints are staggered that way it doesn't match and it doesn't have to so I mean my first quilt I think I made out of um some old sheets and some dressmaking cottons that I had you know, just something to try it. Um, and even now, I mean, this- But nowadays that's totally frowned upon because if it's not 100% cotton, it's wrong. And it, it's, it's very interesting because it's, as you say, I think that the rules, whether we follow them or not, they are definitely breathing down our necks one way or another. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, just, I, I think I feel a bit sad sometimes for people starting out because they feel that like bombard, I've got to buy this, I've got to buy that, I've got to buy this. You don't have to have any of it. You just need to pick up your fabric, look at it, decide what you want to do. Just take it steady. And 
the best thing to do is to either go to a shop and go to classes or join a group. There will always be people who will help you. Um, me quarters, which you know I belong to, we have a morning meeting and an evening meeting every month. Obviously not the last year. The morning meeting was literally for some just a sit and natter, but it was, we had several people that started to come. They wanted to do something, had no idea how to do it, or they'd started something, but didn't know where they'd gone wrong. And you will always find on the whole that 95, 99% Center quilters are quite happy to show somebody how to do anything. They're oh, completely quite happy to agree with you. But I think there's a lot of people who struggle to find that group. And I think a lot of people I know, I, you know, you yourself know, the only reason my group existed is because I was rejected from every group I applied for. They didn't want men, men aren't allowed. It was, I think one woman even wrote to me and said I needed to have, she needed to have a safe place uh, without a man being involved, which it is what it is, but if I'd said that to a woman, uh, I would never be, it, it's just, it, it's a very interesting thing because trying to find a group is hard. It's really, really hard. But yeah, when I you're in that group and you find these incredible women that are so kind and so giving of their time and their energy, it's amazing. I mean, as you said, I've done Project Linus, I did Quilts for London, I was chair of Mead. Half the time I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I just did it anyway. I'm very good at organising people, not so good always at following my own rules, but that's beside the point. <laughs> but over this, these lockdowns we've had, the worst part has been not being able to mix with people for my sewing. It's been awful. But you'll find, like for me, I've, I've taken everything onto Zoom, so that's worked. So exactly. they are out there. It's just unfortunate you've got to seek them out. Yes, I, I think that's it. I mean, you've got somebody like Jenny Doe in America. Brilliant. She's lovely. She has nice, simple, straightforward patterns on the whole, you know. There's loads on YouTube now, which there didn't used to be. There's loads on uh, Zoom. And I think it's just have a look and talk. What's been your biggest regret in quilting? I don't, don't know. I think I've done more or less things that I wanted to do. I wish I was better at quilting. I wish I was better at following instructions because I don't think there's a quilt yet where I've followed the instructions to the letter. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if you're offered the opportunity to do something, and you want to do it then do it because after all you might not get that opportunity again i mean i've done loads of different workshops and i've really enjoyed the workshops and i've gone home and my husband said what's that going to turn into i said a ufo I said i never want to do it again i said but i really enjoyed doing it but i just now know i don't want to do that sort of thing and sometimes that's that's actually a really good point because I think sometimes you do make something, you thoroughly enjoy it, you don't want to do it anymore. I recently taught a class, sorry, I'm going to grab it here underneath all my devices. I taught a class mm -hmm. on English paper piecing, doing this, because yeah. I think a lot of people have this wonderful habit of starting something and not being able to finish it. And I remember teaching the class to the lady and she looked at it and she made it and she says, I absolutely, with every fibre of my being, hate English paper piecing. I will never hand sew ever again. That was the worst experience of my whole life. But I really enjoy doing it with you, John. Hate it, never doing it again. Is that OK? I couldn't stop laughing because it's so honest and it's truthful. And yeah. there are projects we do where we just hate it. Yes. Yeah. But it's very difficult. I mean, I actually threw two pieces away once because I just couldn't do it. I just didn't like it. Um, sometimes I've just cut them up and stuck them in something else. <laughs> but <laughs> that's good work. But hexagons, you see, the thing that I found out about all those years ago, I quite enjoy doing. Half an inch is about my smallest. I have done quarter of an inch. No, no. I've, I've got, I got sent uh, 250 quarter inch um, uh, hexagons the other day. 
Are they all, all tapped ready and everything? No, just papers. No, definitely not. I'm going to go with... <laughs> no. <laughs> Irene, you have been such an enormous part of my quilting journey. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you, because truly... I have laughed more with you than any person alive. And if there is ever a person out there that anybody needs to look at, that if you need to bridge that generational gap to have a really good friend with somebody who's 106 years old this year, really, you are that woman. Thank you, John. Well, you will never know how much you're part of my life as well. I never met anybody quite like you, but you... I didn't know I needed you, but when I met you, you fitted in perfectly and I, I just love you to bits and I really enjoyed the classes. Well, no one can ever say we haven't laughed, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always get everybody to end off with some wonderful uplifting comment or something that you would say to give people inspiration. What would be your little message to people? The best thing you can do is if somebody asks you if you'd like to try something, say yes. But it's something you really, really are not sure about. Just say, can I think about it? It depends what it is. I'm very good at saying, oh, yes, I'll help. And I'm thinking, why did I open my mouth? And you can't get back. But if you're doing something, somebody wants you, wants to show you or teach you something different, say, yes, please. You never know. It might be the most favourite thing you ever do. On the other hand, like the lady in your hexagon class, it, she knows it's something she will never, ever do again in her life. But just have fun. If you're not enjoying what you're doing, then it's not right for you. That's all I can say. It's a great way to end it. Irene. Thank you so much for your friendship. So, thank you so much for your kindness. And thank you so much for doing this. I really, really appreciate and love you to pieces. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. You Bye. have a great day, darling. Stay safe. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. because you were always giving love to everybody else. Oh, thank you. And these were the blocks that I lost. <laughs> from me. Because if Sandra gives me a hand, yeah. this is your book. You would you That's that fabric you said did I like. Is it? <laughs> Ooh, kills the fruit. Oh, wow. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, you You're on video. Oh, Give your ass over here and come and read your quilt. <laughs> but the great thing is, is it's so big, yeah. it goes right over you. <laughs> and there's your back. Yeah. And these are made from all the ladies of Tring and Quilt Tring, and there are a couple of ladies from Mead who made as well. Oh, you're lovely. Thank you. Was it just me? It was everybody else. Anne as well, and yeah, Sandra. You. And we all had a binding party the other day. Mm -hmm. And that one I can't be asked. You can bind your own book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of binding. Stop, 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 stop. Abigail. Because oh, you're going to make me wobble. So we're hoping your husband doesn't mind it on the bed too much, but it's huge, so it's going to have to go on that's the bed. That's fine. It's beautiful. 90 inches square. Bloody hell. Mm. And that's what you've been packing around with. Maybe. Yeah. No, that, that one. No, because the blocks arrived. Blocks, yeah. The blocks were arrived and were put in a bag. And I emptied, you know, I bought all that fabric and mead. Yeah. I got the blocks mixed up and put them in another bag. And was going to pull the bag out yesterday, found them. Yeah. I thought, no, it's got to be done. And then it was going to be a cushion. And then I thought, my God, that's a big cushion. <laughs> <laughs> so you're only little, it's now a lap quilt. Yeah. Amanda did those. Everybody did. Well, and then Angie did the big ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that those two, the way they've done that, looks like a um, butterfly. Yeah, 
Yeah, it does. It does. It. Yeah. But they're all a bit different. Yeah, they are. Yeah, different fabrics. But can I add, are you going to be cross if I tell her the story? What story? So, you know how I make fun of your age? Yeah. I must be rubbing off on people because that was in my one pound box and someone turned around and said, you know what, I'm going to get that fabric because it's proper old lady fabric and it'll go nicely in the old lady's clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you now? Can you spot Anne's block? Because you love that yellow. So there you go. You can now have a play with your quilt. We have a, we have a label for the back which we're going to put on today. Oh, thank you. Because it's only got quilted on Wednesday. No, Tuesday. Tuesday morning, yeah. Yeah, quilted Tuesday morning. Bound for